So here we have the etches for the body, which are in brass. Um, the part numbers are etched into the uh, to the parts, so you can e easily identify them, and these all match up with the instructions as far as the assembly is concerned. And we have the uh, the foot plate. Um, the end has been bent up slightly. That's purely to get it in the box, so because it's quite a long foot plate on this loco, it's quite a big loco. Um, we have the tank sides there, one there, one there. Um, we have the cab sides, we have the cab front and rear, uh, back head detail, roof, various other bits and pieces detail. The only bits that, uh, that are not included here are those bits which are cut out and pre-rolled, such as the boiler and firebox, smoke box, etc. Here we have the chassis edges. The chassis edges in this kit are in nickel silver as opposed to brass. I actually prefer nickel silver as a metal to work with, it's a much nicer metal to work with, it solders better, it takes paint better and it stays cleaner. You know, brass tends to tarnish and it's quite a greasy metal brass. But um, all the new kits in the Agenoria range are all nickel silver including the body parts that the old kits do, uh, do contain brass parts. Here we have the main frames inside here, spacers for the frames, coupling rods, brakes, various other bits and pieces of detail for the chassis. I suppose where any uh, design process starts these days is, uh, is usually with uh, computers and the etching process these days is no different for me at least. Um, I tend to design using AutoCAD although AutoCAD is not really designed for this particular process um, it came to me uh, at uh, virtually nothing so I didn't have to pay for it so therefore I'm using a package that, uh, that I'm used to using now so uh, I carry on. The main process uh, involved with the start of doing an etch um, is obviously when you've got your measurements from the, uh, from the kit, the, from the prototype itself is to start off with a box and the box is usually the uh, actual measurements of how the etch will come out. In this case this box that's on the screen here is 18 inches by, by 12 inches which is a common size for an etch. I also use uh, 24 by 12 on a regular basis but basically we start off with a box and then if you want to start drawing say we're going to draw a chassis and we'll start with a line and then if we've got a distance, we type in a distance. So we have a very basic outline of a chassis there in that we have three bearing holes, in this case being an 060. We would probably, off the drawings that we have, have a measurement from there to there to the front of the, uh, the chassis and the same there. I'm just drawing these lines in just for schematic problems. Uh, so for schematic reasons at the moment, so we know actually any dimensions. Um, and we will gradually add detail to that over and over again uh, until we've got the side of the chassis. Once we've got the side of the chassis like that, then with the AutoCAD thing, it's very easy to repeat the, uh, the other side of the chassis by simply copying what is there, dragging it across, and we've got the same again. So here we have a detailed chassis. Uh, this is actually a chassis for a Fowler 2F uh, 060 dock tank, uh, which I drew earlier. Um, shows a little bit more detail on it, um, both sides of the chassis, um, some spring detail, the bearing holes, um, various uh, lines for various things, and holes for brakes, etc, etc. A little bit more detail on that. So when we've got to that stage, um, we can then do a bit more filling in then for various things. Moving on a stage, uh, this particular part of this drawing here um, is a panel. These panels are made a specific size to fit into the boxes of the kits. Um, so that basically governs the space that I have within there to put the parts that I need. These particular parts here, uh, the cab sides and tank sides for uh, another loco that uh, is under production at the moment, which is namely uh, this particular beast here, which is a, a kit snow 4 um, This is the BR version of it. And the tank that you can see there uh, 
is there and you'll notice that there are rivets on here which aren't on that drawing and that's because if I drag this out on the other part of the drawing which is there that is actually the negative side of it and there you can see the rivets there and that part of the tank there is the fold line there so that will fold round and the rivets at the bottom here and I don't know whether you can see there is a line there which is not on there because again that particular side is there just there so this positive and negative side of the drawings as we call it um, you can see that this side will create one tool for the etching process and to make it simpler here these can be done in layers and this is effectively the other side of the tool. Um, I use various space on the etch, I never waste any space on the etch. This is all for one particular loco but this particular space down here was spare um, so there we actually have that is effectively that part of this crane tank um, just a, using up spare space in order to test out some future kits rather than waste the space because it doesn't matter how much you put in in there it doesn't cost any more to have the tooling done so when we talk about an etching tool uh, what we're referring to is that the drawing that you've just seen is emailed to the company uh, that produces these etching tools from that drawing and basically what the tool is is just two sheets of acetate when we were talking about the positive and the negative side of the, the drawing, as you'll see in this, this drawing is in two parts. That will be the negative drawing and that will be the positive drawing. And what they do with this process is that they get a piece of metal, they spray it with a resistor, um, a chemical resistor, and it's placed between these two sheets and then it's exposed to ultraviolet light which shines through and wherever it's clear the light shines straight through and it fixes the chemical process uh, in the, on the metal. Where it's black, uh, it doesn't. And it does this from both sides. So that on the reverse side, you will have anything that's black on both sides will etch all the way through. And anything that's just black on one side, like here, that will just etch through from, from the one side. Once they've, once they've done the metal, they take the metal out, it's sprayed with acid, and as I say, it, the acid attacks the metal from both sides and etch it. So when the nice man at the etchers phones you up to say that the etchers are ready, you go along and collect them, and you will get a sheet of etch um, that will then go to make whichever loco this is, that particular sheet that you've just seen went to make this particular prototype, um, all the edge parts that you see here uh, on the loco uh, are then assembled, folded, rivets punched out etc etc which we will go on to explain how an edge kit is put together uh, so but this is basically what you get back. There are obviously other processes involved in producing the kit itself then because various parts, chimneys, domes, safety valves, etc, etc have to be made and that process for those is completely different to the etching process. We're just going to deal with the etching process for now. Um, and same in the other side, slot the bearing in, a bit of flux around the edge, oops. And again, just touch the two edges and let the solder flow around the edge follow its way around. There we go. Um, this kit comes supplied with uh, Slater's wheels which are plastic centre wheels with a metal rim and you get an axle with two fixing screws and 
you get screws and bearings for the coupling rods which go into the boss at the end. So should we just break them out of the packet? Because these wheels have plastic centers you do tend to get little pips where the injection process leaves little marks on the end. In order to flatten them off you get yourself a little bit of emery cloth and just place the wheel on flat and just do a circular motion like that just to clean the plastic off. That's all that's required. Just turn it slightly through 90 degrees and do it again and the same again. And just keep going like that and once you've done that then it'll smooth the back out and it'll make it nice and smooth and when the wheel is on the on the axle itself then it'll run true and square. There again we have the screw that's fixed to that wheel, place the bearing on it and the coupling rod. It's in the hole. Just want to go in. There we go. And again. nuts and then that effectively forms a coupling rod for those two wheels. Obviously there isn't a coupling rod on the other side at the moment so if you turn one wheel the other one will turn but then it will uh, it'll know when you've got the coupling rod on the other side that, uh, that in, if it's on this position on this side then it'll be on that position on the other side then the wheels will rotate taking the coupling rods with it and then again we will repeat from there the front wheel as well and the same on the other side. If you're still a little bit intimidated and put off by soldering, um, this particular model that you see here uh, was actually built by Tom Gardner. He was 14 years old so I mean, I'm sure that uh, you'll agree that uh, if a 14 year old could build something to this sort of standard then there's no reason why you couldn't either. Um, this is an Aginoria kit, it um, was one that he chose himself that he wanted to do. It's exactly the same components that you've just been shown with the thing, just a different prototype that's all. Um, but he built this completely on his own, I mean, admittedly he had some assistance with uh, you know, what to do and, and, and guidance while he was doing it, but he even did the painting himself. So 